Hello, and welcome to the EDRM Global Webinar Channel. My name is Mary Mack. I'm the CEO and Chief Legal Technologist for EDRM. Today's webinar is an EDRM collaboration with our trusted partner, eDiscovery Today. It's how a smoking gun message illustrates the importance of Slack ESI and eDiscovery. Our faculty experts are, of course, Doug Austin and Derek Duarte, Colleen Freeman, and John Sten. We welcome your questions and feedback in the console, and this webinar will be recorded and available for replay at your convenience, as will every month's webinar. Kaylee, what do we have for resources? You will see a paper clip um, in your right-hand side of your console. United Lex has kindly provided a link to the case study on the matter they'll be discussing today, as well as their press release. There's also a link to Reed Smith partner Dave Cohen's great article published um, on Lexology on the topic. And what's up next on EDRM's webinar channel on November 30th, Tips and Tricks Data Collection for Cloud Workplace Applications. And you'll see the eDiscovery Day link. It's eDiscovery Day this Thursday, and we can't wait. There are lots of virtual and live um, opportunities to network and um, get some great education. So be sure to check that out and register for Doug Austin, the seven best e-discovery case law webinar. And that's going to be something. Um, as well as EDRM special presentation, the 411 on special masters and the and discovery mediators. And last but certainly not least, eDiscovery Today and EDRM have our annual survey out, the 2023 State of the Industry Report Survey. It is very short. It took me three minutes to take it. And we would love if you'd share your thoughts and insights. Back to you, Mary. All right. And at the end of the webinar, you can download a certificate of attendance from the top of the viewing screen on the console to use for your continuing education requirements. Now, our moderator today is none other than Doug Austin. Doug is an established eDiscovery thought leader with over 30 years experience providing eDiscovery best practices, legal technology consulting, and technical project management services to numerous commercial and government clients. Doug has published a daily blog since 2010, and he's got some things to bring to us today. Doug? Well, thank you, Mary and Kaylee, and uh, thanks everybody for being here today. I'm very excited about uh, this uh, webinar because uh, uh, we, we have the actual team that worked on the Red Wolf case that we'll be discussing, which is one of those seven uh, most important cases of the year that we'll be discussing on Thursday. So let's introduce them. And I'll start with Derek. Uh, Derek Duarte is the Senior Vice President of Litigation at United Lex. As a litigator and technologist, Derek brings a unique perspective to the challenges of the legal services industry. Derek has testified as an expert on e-discovery and computer forensics in state and federal courts. He gets his kicks from applying a deep understanding of digital forensics to complex litigation cases, discovering digital truth and bad puns. Hey, that's my job. Um, he's excited by the potential of legal technology to improve access to justice, bolster our democracy, and advance the practice of law. As president of Blackstone, at Blackstone Discovery, he was named to Silicon Valley Business Journal's 40 Business Leaders Under 40 list for driving innovation and growth in the e-discovery industry. Colleen Freeman is a senior director of global litigation at United Lex. Colleen has worked in the industry for over 20 years as a licensed attorney and a discovery consultant. She's highly sought after as a recognized expert in the field with notable experience in antitrust litigation and securities fraud. Colleen led the expert team that was chosen by the plaintiff steering committee to support the complicated discovery work in the Blue Cross Blue Shield antitrust litigation. In her role as a senior director at United Lex, she regularly consults with AmLaw 100 uh, firms and global Fortune 50 companies on internal investigations, complex litigation, and enforcement. She's also responsible for managing large global accounts, providing thought leadership, and building new strategic partnerships. Colleen recently held a five-year term as the president of the ASET's New England Ex Executive Board and served as a founding member of the Boston Bar Association's JD Advisory Committee. 
Finally, John Sten is a partner and office managing attorney of Armstrong Teasdale's Boston office. A former SEC enforcement attorney, John specializes in white collar and securities defense. His client, Red Wolf Energy Trading, is a trader of electricity in the highly specialized world of day ahead virtual market electricity trading. Given this com complex financial market, they turned to John for help when they realized that one of their own traders was executing trades for a competitor using Red Wolf's trading systems and financial capital. The subject litigation resulted, and here we are today. And that's a great segue into our agenda, uh, where the focal point of our discussion will be the Red Wolf case. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to set the stage by discussing how much the use of collaboration apps has grown in recent years, what some of the ch challenges are with, with, alloc uh, with collaboration apps, and we'll identify some other important recent case law rulings that addressed discovery of chat and collaboration apps. We'll also discuss the form in which Slack data is addressed in discovery and identify some recommendations for improving discovery of collaboration app evidence. We also love questions, and we'll try to leave some time at the end to address questions from you all, but we certainly welcome them uh, throughout the discussion as well, and we'll try to pick them up as we, uh, as we go. Um, also, we will send out a copy of the slides after the presentation, so you can look for that. And as Mary mentioned, you can download a certificate of, the, of attendance uh, to pursue CLE credit in your state if you need it. Of course, any ideas expressed by us here today are our own, not those of our organizations, clients, or partners. We would be slackers if we failed to mention that. So with that said, uh, let's get into it. And we'll start here. Um, we're asking the question, why are we seeing so much talk about discovery of collaboration app data? It's like asking the famous bank robber, Willie Sutton, why he robbed banks. Uh, he said he did so because that's where the money is. Uh, we're increasingly focused on discovery from collaboration apps because more and more, that's where the data is. And here are two indicators of that uh, with the growth of users in Zoom, which jumped from 10 million users to a whopping 300 million users when the pandemic hit and introduced us to terms like Zoom bombing and the cat lawyer. Uh, the growth of Microsoft Teams has been a bit more gradual, but there are now more Teams users than citizens of all but five countries in the world. So, John, what have you seen at Armstrong Teasdale and at your clients with respect to use of collaboration apps since the pandemic? Thanks, Doug. Um, obviously, the use of collaboration apps has been around pre-pandemic, um, you know, but they were more on the fringe list. We'd see them in the, in the workplace in tech-related startups. Um, I saw them in the education space. If anyone has children in high school or college, they tend to know what Google Docs is. Those were the ones, the mainstream that everybody seemed to know. But with the pandemic and then working remotely, um, obviously the use of these grew you know, exponentially as your charts obviously show. Um, and with that, so did the awareness that those could be a of, of source of valuable discovery and litigation. Um, they always existed before, but people tended not to think of them. Sometimes discovery, I think, runs behind where uh, the technology really is. Uh, I saw that with emails, then with texts, and now it's with these these sort of collaboration apps, you know, including Zoom. If you think about it, Zoom has a chat function that no one ever thinks about as being a viable source for discovery. But, you know, with their familiarity with it now, a lot of lawyers are thinking in that way. Um, so that's really what we've seen is that with remote working, people's comfort levels and knowledge of these types of apps have, have really grown. And you know, with it, so have discovery requests regarding the same. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, a great point about Zoom chats. Uh, that's one thing a lot of people uh, forget about. So um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we certainly are seeing that growth. And uh, while the growth in the use of Slack has been a little bit slower, uh, it's grown as well. And keep in mind, the numbers you see here are just paid customer organizations. Uh, when you add those organizations who use it for free, uh, the number is as high as 600,000 organizations, including 65 of the Fortune 100. Um, Slack is heavily used by those who do use it uh, with an average of nine hours a day in the app and one billion total minutes each weekday. 
And, and by the way, the name Slack was originally an acronym for searchable log of all communication and knowledge. You can try to stump your friends with that one uh, when Slack was developed way back in 2009. So, Derek, how frequently are you and United Lex uh, seeing collaboration app data in your e-discovery projects today? Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, on, on the litigation side, it, it often varies by industry. Uh, highly regulated industries are, are not going to be using these collaboration apps as heavily, whereas our, our tech clients are, are using them, you know, almost entirely as, as their communication stack. Um, so we're, it really varies by client, but we're, we're definitely seeing it out there. Um, for investigations, we are seeing this uh, for every single case. Um, if you if you scratch the surface enough, um, you'll find relevant collaboration app or communication app data. Um, I'm often not finding anything within emails these days, and almost always have to go to these apps. Yeah, that's really it's really interesting how the 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 location of a lot of these communications has really shifted. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, really interesting to see how the trends have changed. So, of course, uh, with there's plenty of collaborate, plenty of discoverable data and plenty of communications in Slack and other collaboration apps. Uh, discovery from those apps uh, can be somewhat challenging. So I mean, for starters, the. Um, uh, the data is different, which means it's not suited for traditional ESI workflows and protocols. So, John, what expectations do you set with your clients regarding discovery of collaboration app data versus discovery of email? Well, the first thing, uh, Doug, is, you know, I act as a counselor to my clients. And what I mean by that is that one of my first jobs is to educate them. The first challenge we always find is exactly what I, I was alluding to in my prior answer, which is no one thinks of it. Um, you know, you readily think, you know, in the old days, you'd think of documents as paper documents, then your understanding evolved and you'd think of emails. Um, you know, you think of things on a system, but no one would think of these collaboration docs, uh, these collaboration apps as discoverable documents. So one of the things I try to do is, is educate them that they are. Um, one has a prophylactic effect because people tend to be freer on apps where they think that, you know, no one's quote listening or ever going to hear it. Um, but two, it's educate them when a subpoena comes in or some sort of document request or discovery request to take an inventory about what they have, you know, on their systems. Do they have Slack as a company um, one? Do they have Google Docs, uh, you know, Google Vault, things like that? You know, what about Zoom? How is it logged? How is it kept? You know, that's really the first thing is sitting down and having a conversation with the client to help them better understand what apps they have and what apps they're using. Um, you know, beyond that, it really falls over to someone like United Lex because the technical part and challenges of these collaboration apps really falls more on, on someone with their expertise. Uh, because a lot of them, as I've seen secondhand, United Lex can talk about it firsthand. Um, they're, they're good for, you know, chatting, they're good for talking, but they're not necessarily made to be extracted. Um, and that's been a challenge. But for me, the first part is, as I said, always sitting down with the client and educating them about what they have. And then, you know, that will then dictate what plan of discovery we have. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of the technical, um, it's certainly, you know, a big part of the, the challenge is, uh, really defining what a conversation is to begin with. And uh, uh, it can be somewhat difficult and arbitrary. So, uh, Colleen, can you talk about the challenges associated with defining and assembling conversations in collaboration apps? Uh, yes, thank you, Doug. We are seeing a wider adoption of collaboration apps, and it's making e-discovery much more complex. Um, part of the challenge is around, as, as John touched on, exporting the chat data and what to do with those exports. You know, so, you know, there is a much more heavier reliance on e-discovery experts um, that really have a, a finer understanding of the nuances of these chat data formats. Um, so, you know, you really have to sit down with counsel and make decisions about how to slice the conversations. And, and along with that, comes into play, you have to look at the search methodology that you're going to use. 
you know, there's one of the challenges that we're seeing is at this point in time, there's no uniformity or standards for search methodologies. You know, so some some parties are making the decision that they're just going to look at a single chat. Some parties are deciding they're going to look at the entire thread. Um, one of the recommended approaches that we've used that has seemed to be uh, much more helpful is a 24 hour window approach where you're getting a much more broader context for the conversation. Um, as you know, these communications can be much more informal in nature. And so if you're really treating a chat like an email and just looking at it individually, you're not going to get the broader context of the conversation. Uh, so there is this inability to treat chat data like conventional data uh, and the traditional e-discovery workflows and legacy processes that we have in place that work so well with email are not really helpful when you're trying to reconstruct these conversations. Um, in addition, another challenge we're seeing is, you know, what constitutes a document? How you search for these chats and define a conversation really greatly impact your ability to identify and produce all relevant messages during discovery. Uh, so again, I, I think, you know, as, as John alluded to in his earlier comments, there is this, this need to kind of lean into the e-discovery experts that can help make the chat export and review process much more manageable, less costly. You know, you really need to do your due diligence with the different chat collaboration tools out there because the way that you export and render messages reviewable in Slack varies from team and Zoom. Um, and so again, I, I think at this time, because we're still as an industry trying to play catch up um, at the court's direction with the e-discovery process, it's really important that you do understand the platform that you're trying to pull data from and you also work with an expert to really custom design how you're going to review and produce those messages. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, the challenge continues to evolve, certainly, and, and great points, uh, Colleen. A uh, question from the audience, uh, back to really the first bullet point, from an internal policy perspective, have you found organizations updating, updating and adequately addressing ESI and e-discovery protocol? Um, I'll just open it up to, to the panel. Uh, and uh, what, have, what have you all found out there? Are, are, are organizations ad adequately, adequately addressing it or are they, or are they behind? Um, I'll go first, if that's okay, it's John. Sure. And um, I would say larger organizations are, are a little more proactive about it. Um, it's a little less so with the smaller organizations or midsize. And, and I think that has to do with their internal infrastructure. You know, usually with a larger organization, you'll have compliance departments of, of serious size and, and depth, the same with their legal departments. And they're keeping abreast. Who knows? Some of them are listening today. Um, but the point is, is that they tend to be proactive about that. And, and you know, when something like this pops up, they're a little more apt to, to go in and look at their own systems for smaller ones tend to be, at least in my business, um, more reactive and really wait for the fire to start before they go, oh, it would have been nice to have a fire extinguisher. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately what we find in too many cases. Um, so uh, great question. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to continue moving on. Um, so there, um, you know, in addition to the, uh, the challenges with assembling a conver conversation, um, there's a ton of apps uh, for use, that are used for collaboration and way more than just Slack, Teams, and Zoom that we've been talking about. Um, and of course, each app stores data differently. So Derek, can you discuss a couple of specific examples of collaboration apps and how Discovery d differs with each of them? Absolutely. So, you know, this is, I always love uh, story time uh, over collaboration apps. Um, so for there, there's so many collaboration apps to talk about, but I think it's really important to think about how the application is, you know, being used inside the organization and, and what the purpose of the uh, app itself is uh, and then where the data is stored. So I'm going to talk about two collaboration apps, which I think illustrate this well, uh, Signal and Blind. 
so Signal is, is all about encryption and uh, denying people access to your communications. I think it pops up in one of the, the cases that, that Doug will mention later. Um, and Signal is really interesting because you're, you're trying to figure out how to get data out of a you know, communication platform that is designed to make it difficult for you to retrieve that information. That being said, um, one of the um, great things about the decentralized nature of Signal is it's one of the few collaboration apps that's actually stored locally on your machine. It's encrypted, but it is stored locally. And if you are storing it on a certain machine, like a MacBook, you can find the decryption key um, and gain access to those chats. So I think it's really important to know, you know what application is being used, where the information is stored, because that's going to inform your ability to respond as a party to discovery requests or to conduct an investigation um, when figuring out exactly where that signal data lives. Signal also syncs across multiple systems. Um, you know, from your iPhone to your Mac. So it's a really good way to think about getting this information from different places and whether or not it's within your custody or control. So I think Signal's a really interesting one. Uh, another fascinating one um, is Blind. So Blind is a communication app. I think it was most prevalently used in the Valley. And the whole point of Blind is it's like to gossip about your work um, but to be anonymous. So blind, you actually don't know who any of the users are. Um, you do receive your anonymized ID with an authentication email to your work email. Um, and that's what grant gives you access to the system. Um, but a lot of folks are in there anonymously, anonymously sharing information about their company um, per the purpose of the app. Um, and so this is another interesting application to know about because this is a good example of how an application can be used in ways that are not intended or maybe even the users don't understand that can have broader implications. Like for example, this blind app, you need to actually have the company email address to gain access to the company workspace. In Silicon Valley, a lot of the tech reporters have learned how to spoof those email addresses. And so like The Verge and Yahoo Tech are actually sitting on these internal anonymized panels. Um, and then, you know, reading that information, which is kind of internal anonymous talk, and then that's becoming a, a leak. So that's a, a leak channel that you might have to um, look at uh, you know, kind of if you're managing your data and your production. So. You know, I think those are really uh, interesting examples because those are two different communication apps which are designed to fit into a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. So understanding what that purpose is, how it, how it can be used, possibly how it can be abused is going to be a critical aspect of developing your ESI strategy. Uh, great, Derek. Thank you. Um, I personally didn't know that much about Blind, so that was very educational. Um, so we're getting some great questions. We're going to try to move on, but I promise we will circle back to, uh, uh, some more of the audience questions here, but, uh, let's quickly touch on, uh, the, uh, the remaining challenges here. Um, certainly our increased use of cloud solutions, uh, means that we're doing more linking to cloud sources, uh, which some people have called modern attachments. Not everybody likes that term, but, um, there, uh, we use those instead of embedded physical attachments within messages. And, this leads to an extra step of having to go collect these cloud sources, uh, which may have changed since the message was created or may not even exist anymore. So certainly that's a challenge. And there's also a challenge uh, of emoji. Uh, and the plural of emoji is emoji, by the way. That is uh, particularly challenging in Slack, where more than 26 million custom emoji uh, have been created by Slack users. So there's just tons of them out there, and uh, they're certainly a, a challenge to, uh, to interpret. And of course, collaboration apps are just one part of the increased challenge of what we would call multi-channel communications and conversations. So let's talk about those for a moment. And uh, in essence, what we're seeing today is business conversations are, they're more complex than ever. They become in many cases bifurcated, trifurcated, or even quadfurcated. And that, yes, that's a real word, I, I looked it up. Um, here's an example of a potential real business scenario involving a company about to release a new product. An R&D team member reaches out to his boss via email expressing safety concerns about the product and links to a report in SharePoint with more information. 
uh, when the boss doesn't respond to the email, which happens because we all get so many emails, he texts her to follow up. That finally gets a response from her directing the employee to start a conversation thread in Slack uh, regarding the SharePoint document. In the meantime, the VP schedules a Zoom meeting with the team to further the discussion and because some team members are out on vacation, records the meeting so they can catch up on it later. Can you imagine that happening in a business today? That probably happens all the time. So what happens when the product is released, people are injured and lawsuits are filed and you have to collect ESI related to discussions about product safety. You're looking at as many as five different sources from which the ESI must be collected to piece back together the discussions that have taken place. And that's the challenge that exists with piecing together conversations today in the modern world. So Colleen, what can e-discovery practitioners do to make sure they can identify all the different components of these multi-channel conversations? You know, that's a great question, Doug, that we are encountering on a regular basis with our, with our clients. And we're also hearing these conversations take place at some of the notable conferences in our industry, like Georgetown, uh, which we just attended two weeks ago. Um, you know, basically you're seeing, as you've outlined here, that professional communication has splintered into countless different programs, applications, devices, and really it's creating a huge challenge for, for counsel and for e-discovery professionals in terms of how are you going to reconstruct conversations that may start out in text, you know, move into a Teams channel or a Teams meeting, then the conversation may move to a phone call and then back into text or email. Um, so, you know, first, you know, you really do need to um, speak with your team about how are they performing their work and how are they communicating? What does that look like? Have them walk you through their responsibilities and the platforms they use. That's a really good way to identify multi-channel communications. You know, once you have those conversations and you're understanding more about the systems and platforms they're interfacing with during the course of the, you know, custodial interview or as you're mapping out your litigation strategy, then you can work with, you know, an experienced e-discovery forensic expert that can help you collect all of these different data sources in a way that you're preserving metadata and in a way that you will capture um, all of the relevant information that you need to. Um, you can also do an audit and you know when you conduct an audit, you can look for steps that may not have um, been defined. So just here is a perfect example. You know, if, if one of the steps in a process is you need a request approval from finance and you don't see an approval request in the data you've collected, then that's a clear sign that the, some other communication has taken place, you know, most likely on another channel that you don't have access yet to. And it will help you identify any other communication channels that may contain relevant data. Uh, in addition, you know, we're also, you know, politicians, you know, use the catchphrase fuzzy math. Well, lawyers now have the concept of fuzzy custodian, you know, as there can be direct messages and private messages between two individual parties, but yet there can also be group chats. And we're seeing a lot of these team channels are used by entire projects, teams, legal case teams, you know, to communicate. So it's really hard, I think, in those instances to truly define an individual custodian. So traditional collection methods and legacy e-discovery processes are proving to be outdated when it comes to working with chat data. Again, I, I really think, you know, the sophistication level and the technological competence that both lawyers and e-discovery professionals are, are now required to have really involves using innovative analytic techniques um, and ECA technology to produce all sorts of tracking reports that can highlight very valuable content regardless of which platform it was on. And you know, those are just some of the, the ways that you might be able to reconstruct these conversations. But again, I think it also goes back to working closely in collaboration on your you know, with your client and your, your legal team 
to really figure out the search methodology, how broad do you think the conversations are extending, and you really do have to look at it on a case-by-case basis. Yeah, um, very uh, some great points there, Colleen, and fuzzy custodians. I like that term, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one there, so I'll have to keep that in mind. That's a great point. Uh, so um, here are some recent notable cases involving Slack and other chat and collaboration apps. I won't spend a lot of time on them, except to say that we've seen at least three significant case law rulings involving Slack in the past 18 months, in addition to the Red Wolf case. And we've also seen several other cases involving sanctions for spoliation of evidence from chat and collaboration apps as well. You'll have the links when you get the slides so you can check out these cases. The Benabone case from last year was particularly notable in that the court found that discovery of Slack data was not unduly burdensome or disproportional and even went so far as to say it was generally comparable to email. So, Derek, what can e-discovery practitioners learn from a case like Benabone? Yeah, so so Benabone's, uh, you know, an interesting one. I, I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, if you're going to have a uh, custodian say that communications happened on Slack, be ready to review and produce it. And I don't think there's a, a pathway, you know, around that anymore. Um, you can kind of constrain the scope of production based on channels or users or time frame. Uh, if you have a, you know, enormous uh, Slack instance and, and you need to narrow the request a little bit. Um, the other thing I would suggest, um, or is just a commentary on Ben and Bone, is I really dislike how a, a lot of courts in our industry in general always try to anchor back to email, uh, you know, as, as a baseline technology or, or a North Star. I think it's really important that we start having, you know, platform within environment conversations. What platform are we using? What is it integrated with? What is the type of environment it is contained in? Because even, you know, certain heavily integrated Slack instances are going to be very difficult to produce from if you're looking for information from the integrations. And we'll get to that in the example later on. And even certain emails like Photon Mail, which is or Proton Mail, which is in one of your, your cases, can be enormously difficult to produce from. Um, and, you know, Gmail has its own challenges as well, though that's, that's fairly straightforward these days. So I think, you know, we really need to be looking at we need to stop trying to set broad legal rules on technology technology platforms. You know, and say, oh, it's, if it's like email, it's easy. If it's not like email, then it's hard. Um, and really take a look at the actual use and the real burden of production. Yeah, I think those are, I think those are all great points. And uh, now we're going to move on to the the main thing we're here to talk about, which is the Red Wolf case, uh, which, by the way, is the most viewed case law ruling on eDiscovery today so far this year. Uh, the ruling is so long that Massachusetts District Judge Mark Wolf needed a table of contents to uh, cover it all, which is usually a bad sign for one party in terms of their discovery failures. Um, he also stated there were more sanctions in this case against defendants for failure to produce documents, quote, than any other case in which this court has presided in more than 37 years, unquote, which he said four times within the ruling. Um, as John's bio indicated, this is a case involving misappropriation of trade secrets uh, by an employee of Red Wolf using the plaintiff's proprietary software to place mock trades for defendants, and the defendants had a series of mis discovery missteps in this case. Uh, defendant Moeller filed a sworn affidavit on behalf of all defendants claiming to have complied with the discovery requirements set forth in Rule 26E, but the defendants kept having to produce documents as the Red Wolf team discovered their existence, including 47 documents that included 14 still images of Red Wolf's system, an Excel file that appeared to be an export of certain data from Red Wolf's proprietary software, and a PowerPoint that included screenshots of Red Wolf's software. Uh, the defendants also kept supplementing with additional productions of messages from their Slack communications platform, with the defendants citing difficulty in conducting discovery from Slack as one of the main reasons for the, for the issues. Eventually, the court ordered the defendants to provide Red Wolf with a copy of the 2019 Slack archive for searching, which, as you can see from the fourth bullet point, uncovered a lot of stuff, including the aforementioned smoking gun message, uh, which, if you read it there, is quite significant. Uh, so regarding all the defendants' discovery misconduct, Judge Wolf stated, 
defendants repeated misconduct occurred despite two orders to review their document production and if necessary, supplement it as required by federal rule of civil procedure 26 E. Mueller twice submitted affidavits representing that he had complied with those orders. Uh, Judge Wolf also stated, Red Wolf has been seriously prejudiced by defendant's misconduct. That's, that misconduct has also seriously injured the court's ability to manage this case and others on its docket. As a practical matter, entering default judgments against BIA and Moeller is the only viable Rule 37b2 sanction. So, as a result, he assessed a default judgment sanction against the defendants and instructed Red Wolf and the defendants to negotiate on damages. So, let's discuss it. Uh, John, from your perspective, how did the case progress to the point where default judgment sanctions were awarded? Um, and what was your approach on when and how to pursue sanctions? Well, let me let me start by saying is that I've only actually ever filed uh, motions for sanctions uh, two times. Mm -hmm. And they were both the ones that you mentioned in this case. Yeah. Um, I've been practicing, you know, I graduated in 1995 and was at the SEC in 94. So I've been around in litigation a long time, and this is the first time that this had to happen. Um, and to give color to it, you know, it, and I think this is why this webinar is actually incredibly relevant, is it didn't have to happen. A lot of the things that we were talking about um, prior to getting into the facts of Red Wolf, they're all in the Red Wolf case. They're all part of it. And we're going to, and I'm going to talk about it um, briefly. So, as you mentioned, at the heart of this, this case is really a misappropriation of, of trade secrets, but also, um, we'll say, a non-compete type situation where, you know, two friends, uh, you know, kids play soccer together, standing on the sidelines, you know, every weekend at different events, get together. One of them, a very intelligent uh, MIT graduate of the Sloan Business School there, uh, is a serial entrepreneur. His name's Greg Muller. The other one is a guy by the name of Christopher Joka. He is an electricity trader in the virtual day ahead markets. And he's an employee of my client, Red Wolf Energy Trading Company, which you have to understand in the energy trading company, my client's actually relatively small. Most of the big players are giant um, utilities. And it's a very volatile type market where you basically, it, it's almost like game theory. You, the day before the market, you actually sort of bid in a virtual sense and then the next day the market runs and it settles based on the difference between reality and and theory um so it's a very volatile very difficult market my client's been doing it for a number of years and has built up an, an enormous amount of of experience and you know a lot of it through hard knocks but these two guys get together and what happens is is the very smart mit guy says hey i have this theory that we could build a machine learning artificial intelligence program that could do electricity trading or at least teach itself how to do this in these markets and you know thereby we could we could make some money from it obviously he needs the other side of the coin which is chris joka the employee of red wolf um who has you know access to the electricity markets plus he has experience in the electricity markets now that would be all great if joka then left his job and went to work with with Greg Muller, but that's not what happened. Instead, they formed a joint venture called BIA um, Capital Markets. And what happened is they went ahead and then started to develop their algorithms and their machine learning uh, using Red Wolf systems, but also testing it out on Red Wolf's uh, trading platform using Red Wolf's capital. So eventually it was found out, Joka left and the lawsuit um, was filed to stop it. During the lawsuit, it went along for first eight months, you know, fairly regularly. Uh, there was a TRO that was denied, and then it went to, because of certain affidavits that were put in, that made it seem as if they were, that Bio was approaching Joka as a, as a potential customer to sell him uh, trades. And that does figure into the, into the default. Um, so we went along, and then we get to discovery, and I was working with my associate at the time, Sarah Reams, who um, she has not been announced so much in this case because by the time the default came along, um, I was at a different firm. But it's important to note because she kept incredibly good records of what happened during discovery. So during it, we get these Slack productions and I was unfamiliar with Slack. So 
and so was Sarah, but she dug in and, you know, really tried to learn what was going on with Slack and how it works. And we were given this first production in PDF form. And we were given two, one from Jilka himself, that was strict PDFs that he had downloaded to his system. And then the other part was this very odd, almost like ASCII text, if everybody remembers the old ASCII text, no code in it. And it was all mushed together in the, in the page after page after page, a very difficult to read text. And we are told by the other side that this is because Slack was, you know, not readily accessible for, you know, discovery tools. And as a result, you know, this is the way their vendor could produce it. Um, taking them at face value, we had no reason not to. Uh, we went along the case, but it became clear, you know, that as we went along, that things were missing. Um, but it wasn't just Slack. We realized that the embedded links that we talked about earlier, those were missing as well. Um, and we couldn't get access to those. So there started to become a number of discovery disputes around a various number of things. And one of them first was this Google Vault issue where we are saying, hey, there's things that we've seen on the net or when we did some, some due diligence on our own that weren't being produced. There's links that we can't access, things like that. And the court, rightly so, um, you know, did not want to get into discovery disputes, viewed what we were doing with some skepticism, um, took it at the word of the defendants that they had given us everything. And actually, I will be candid, was quite irritated with me at various points of this case. <laughs> And it's really important to understand that color because it, it does show up in the end here um, because I would stick with it. Sarah was was dogged with it and she would stick with it um, and say, you know, trying to make sense of these. She spent a lot of time trying to put them in her and it never worked. So then by and large, flip forward, um, we're in, you know, COVID land at this stage. I'm still making these noises. Um, the court had already at least, you know, we file them, our first motion to compel. Um, I started the office of Armstrong Teasdale at that time. And so now it was with me and, and my colleague, Allison McFarland, who figures in. Um, but again, I want to make sure Sarah gets the recognition because she does come back up in this case later. Um, and her work was invaluable in that. But as we go along, you know, we file our first motion to compel saying, you know, we're not getting certain documents. The slacks obviously are missing certain things. Um, it just didn't make any sense. And you know when your gut tells you that, but you it's more like a death by a thousand little cuts because you can't point to any one thing. And the judge is like, okay, Mr. Sten, I get it. Plaintiffs say they've given you every, or defendants say they've given you everything. So I, I'm gonna say to them, supplement according to you know rule 26E, if you have anything new to supplement with, otherwise file an affidavit saying we're good. So that happened once, that happened twice. Um, and then the real watershed moment occurred where this kept building up. And as I said, the judge was quite irritated with me at times because it was a reoccurring theme. And I think at times he had said, look, it, I've dealt with it. Let's move on. But obviously it was very difficult to move on because you just, every time you had a deposition or anything else, you just could tell. Um, and then the watershed moment really was actually of defendants counsels doing. We had filed, um, you know, we had various motions pending and then late 2021, and you'll have to excuse me, sometimes my dates and COVID get mixed up, but late yeah. 2021 really does, right? Um, Defendants Council come up with a number of new documents um, from Google Vault. And what they said was um, it was 47 documents and some of it were, were screenshots of, of Red Wolf systems. And then there was a really damaging PowerPoint to them as well that sort of an analysis and case study of, of what went wrong with some of the trading and ways to fix it. And the, I think at that point, the judge realized, wait a second, maybe they're on to something here. Um, and that's when it really started to change. And, and again, counsel for the defendants did their duty in that they, they saw these new documents where my understanding was they were called to their attention as part of prepping an expert. But either way, they turned them over voluntarily. We didn't find them. Um, but you know, it, it definitely led the judge to start to listen to us and dig into this. Um, so at that point, you know, we filed another motion to compel. We looked at um, as to the slacks because, and I'm going to try to describe this briefly. Here's where things went wrong with the slacks originally, which is it became very clear that 
what had happened is we had two types of document requests. We had all communications between our employee, Chris Joka, and any of the BIA defendants. So all the individuals, you know, who were doing this joint venture to create this competing electricity trading platform. So that's easy because you have two counterparties, I'll call it. You have Joka on one side and then you have anyone he worked with at the BIA venture. So we wanted all those Slack communications, no matter what they were. But then when you didn't have identified counterparties, we had agreed to search terms. And, you know, this is where um, Ms. Reams comes in because she had, you know, logged w what the agreement was. And it wasn't about Mr. Joka's communications. It was about any non-Joka communications. And we had very clear emails to that effect, which I think show up in the record. And so the judge saw that and said, okay, you're right, plaintiff. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to order them to produce all the Joka communications, regardless of whether there was a search hit in it or not. So backing up a little bit during that search hit issue, there's the other issue that pops up. So first we had no one talked about the discovery here um, and what they were doing, because when we asked in August of 2021, like, why were you doing this? They go, well, you never asked. The other one was this idea that when they got a quote hit, they would produce five communications before and five after that was never talked about with us. And it leads to the question that uh, Ms. Freeman was talking about, which is what constitutes a document and what constitutes a communication? Because from our point of view, it was, okay, if there was a hit for anybody outside of the Joka world, then you should produce that entire thread. Now, in our understanding of, of Slack, what thread meant was never, was never discussed. So we thought it was broad and obviously defendants decided to make it as narrow as possible, but they never told us. Um, and Rule 26E obligates the producing party to discuss e-discovery and, and the form and the manner of which it's being produced. So we had another motion out there at that point, and we got the entire archive of all what we'll call Jilka related ones. Any Slack channel that he was a participant in um, was then produced in its entirety. So at that point, we're now up to spring of 2022. Trial's coming. Ooh, it's coming because um, it was scheduled for August of 2022. So we're on, a, we're on a very tight schedule here. And we get that first production. Um, and this time we said, hey, enough with this messing around with, with because we'd learned that they had used this guy from Kazakhstan, um, minus Abramian, and that they were paying him with shares of the company. So they said, okay, let's put that aside. And what we'll do is um, we'll give you, you know, vendor of your choice, we'll just send you, you know, the raw the raw extract of any of those channels that, that Mr. Joke is on. So that's what happened. We sent it to our vendor, they uploaded it. And very quickly, um, Allison McFarland, my colleague was looking at it and within the, you know, 48 hours, uh, emailed me or texted me and said, Hey, you know, there are a lot of documents in here that we haven't seen before that contain the, the quote search hits that bias said they were using to, to give things. So to make it sort of a complicated thing, a little less complicated, which is this, which is that basically they said, Hey, we gave you everything with search hits. You want more than that. Now we'll give you more than that. But it turns out they didn't even give us what they said they did in the first time. That's what prompted the second motion to compel because, um, and again, even there it could have been avoided because the first thing I did was turn around and say to the other side, Hey, we're getting all this stuff. What's going on with this? You know, I didn't want to have to go back in front of Judge Wolf, who's a very tough judge, very good, very bright, but does not have a lot of patience for any of this, um, as everybody can now see. So I talked to the other side. They said, well, you're going to have to ask Mr. Mueller when you depose him in a few weeks. So I did. His explanation was basically, oh, well, you know, the, the program that Mr. Abramian wrote missed any direct messages that happened during Slack. Well, that made no sense because these weren't direct messages. So I asked defendants that and they had no explanation at the time. We move forward, uh, second motion um, for sanctions gets filed and they come up with a new explanation saying, well, no, it's not that, it was this user ID that was missed. And so now we have this third explanation of why, why things have been missed. And that's the point the judge just dropped into overdrive because trial was imminent. This was all supposed, this all happened right on the eve of trial. We were supposed to pick a jury the next day. And so then the court basically took over and said, Mr. Sten, I want an affidavit from, you know, a competent 
expert in the e-discovery as to how much this would have cost had by been able to done this through a vendor in the first place. I want to know if it could even have been done in the first place through a vendor as you maintain and they say they couldn't and and just named a laundry list of things that we had to do including identifying what documents were new versus old which is very difficult in this case and that's when united lex came in i i've known colleen freeman for years i i respect her and when you know when the stuff was really hitting the fan on this i had to turn to someone who knew what they were doing and, and she came up um with a team derek and the rest of them and they were fantastic because we were sort of making things up um, as we went along, as far as trying to piece together, you know, this this patchwork that was originally given to us by defendants, and then you know the way a normal one would have a normal production would have been done. The judge ordered that the original archive from 2019 be produced. United Lex took that and started trying to overlay that and what the other documents were to try to find out, you know, what was missing from that first one. That was a really hard thing to do. And it took a lot of legwork, both from my team, um, Allison and others here, um, Justin Engel, my partner jumped in and, you know, got up to speed. Um, but everybody was working on it. Derek's affidavit was fantastic. Um, you know, it hit all the points and I think was pivotal in the judge's decision. Um, and, and that's really where it took off. But I can tell you August, and I think it went into September, but every, the judge must have been writing his opinion because every time um we turned around we got an order for give us this information by tomorrow give us this information in two business days tell us this now we didn't know that he was writing but i think in hindsight that's what it looked like was happening and that you know he would have a question and then he would order the parties to reduce each of their respective sides on that eventually as as everybody knows this culminated in this in this ruling um i really wish it never had happened you know, that's not the way I want a case to end. Um, it's a great lesson for everybody, including myself, about paying attention to ESI and, you know, partnering with people who know what the heck they're doing. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over because I've spoke way too long as it is. <laughs> um, OK, um, a great um, recounting of the case, uh, John. I really appreciate it. So let me turn uh, to uh, Colleen and Derek here. Um, so uh, so Colleen, uh, Obviously, Slack is challenging. Uh, what was the level of knowledge of Slack um, by, by the plaintiff, by Red Wolf in this case, and how did that impact uh, what they requested from the other side originally? Thanks, Doug. Um, you know, interesting side note here, you know, the two original people involved in the case going back four years in 2019, uh, were John and myself. You know, this case survived each of us making a you know, career move. Um, and, you know, I appreciated that he sought me back out at United Lex when there was, you know, an issue later on with this Slack archive. So, you know, initially in 2019, when I was working with Sarah and John, the plaintiffs themselves, you know, were not using Slack. And honestly, they could not have been reasonably expected to question the defendant's format production for this data. They relied on representations from defendants counsel, as, as John has pointed out, when negotiating the ESI protocols. So they trusted the representations were made in good faith. Um, also at the time, you know, again, it, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but in 2017, 18, and 19, Slack user adoption hadn't exploded. So while the communication tool had been around for many years, it really hadn't been completely mainstream. You know, the way that we're seeing rem remote workforces use it during the pandemic and post pandemic. And I, I believe, you know, in a situation like this, the parties should be transparent about the tools they use and their underlying methodologies. It really allows for more meaningful negotiation between the parties. And had that been the case, you know, maybe there would have been a different result in Red Wolf. It may not have lasted four years um, and the plaintiff may not have suffered as much competitive injury. So, you know, expecting a plaintiff to quote unquote, name that platform is kind of a gotcha game. When a party to a litigation asks for communications and you have a platform like Slack, then you need to respond by saying that this is 
what you're using and explain how you're using it and how the use of the tool relates to the case. So rather than just hide the ball and play the game, oh, you didn't say Slack, so I'm not gonna produce anything. Um, I really think that if parties are much more forthcoming about the collaboration applications and the technology they're using in those earlier negotiation stages of discovery, it will be much more productive for everyone involved. It won't waste judicial resources. Um, and one last point, I, I also think it underscores the fact that it's just not enough for a company to implement a chat collaboration platform these days. It's what a lot of general counsel are calling table stakes technology. I'm hearing that quite a bit. But now courts are requiring the, that these companies understand their obligation to properly collect these chat messages, render them in a readable format to review, and produce relevant messages to the other side. Um, you know, and as Derek touched on in the Benabone case, judges are requiring much more technological competence when working with these tools. So if you're if you're going to have a collaboration application in use at your company. You also need to do your due diligence and fully understand what it's going to take to export data out of that tool when you're faced with defending a litigation or you have an investigation um, to, to take on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great points, Colleen. Um, so, Derek, um, uh, so obviously you all had to uh, deal with some technical challenges and so forth. What were some of the technical issues you observed during this case? And when you received the Slack archive, um, uh, talk a little bit about how much the time you had to, an to analyze it and what United Lex did to support Armstrong Teasdale in determining what the defendants failed to produce. Absolutely. So I'm seeing a lot of great questions from the audience and I, I appreciate them. So I'm going to try and keep my answers fast so we can get to those fantastic questions. If there's anything that the audience would like me to cover on the Red Wolf case in particular that I gloss over, please drop it into the questions and um, we'll make sure to get to it. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, the technical issues that we saw, I think these are these are issues that pretty much all of the attendees um, on this call um, you know, could have seen uh, the producing party um, did not was was interpreting the user profile field inside Slack in a way that they were excluding certain uh, channels from search uh, without a justifiable reason to do so. They were using case sensitive search. You know, basically the capital letters had to match um, in their search terms, um, and they were using a standard of production five. Uh, messages before and five messages after that were not related to how the platform was used or how the information is is stored and exported out of Slack. Uh, so those were all, you know, immediate red flags that, you know, I was able to actually discuss with, with John, I think on this, his first phone call to us, uh, which I think was on a Thursday night. And uh, we had to produce these insights like all uh, e-discovery matters by, by Monday. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, a crazy, crazy uh, expedited amount of time. But uh, obviously, you you all uh, covered a lot. And um, Derek, um, certainly one of the things you all talked about is you is part of the end result was to pro provide an affidavit. So Colleen, talk a little bit about that. It was a highly technical analysis. What did you and you, you Lex do to describe your efforts in a manner that the court could fully understand the issues? Another great question, Doug. I mean, as one judge noted at Georgetown, you know, these judges aren't using chat communication tools. They're not always active on social media. And so they're really asking, you know, counsel and their experts to keep that in mind when they're explaining any highly technical analysis to the court. Uh, and that was something that I think instinctively Derek and I really thought about you know, our guiding principle when I work with Derek and our team on how to tell the story um, in a way that the judge could really fully understand it and how our findings could support certain inferences was not just to say what we did, but to really explain what that inference could be, what, what inference could be drawn from from the finding or the evidence, you know, and I'll give you just a quick example. You know, we, 
found 87 empty Slack channels. Now on the face of it, that's not really truly remarkable or compelling. If we just put in the affidavit that during, you know, during our replication of the workflow, we found 87 empty Slack channels, I don't know that the judge would have really focused on that. But when you couple that with a logical inference that could be drawn from the evidence, it's much more compelling. So when you say, we found 87 empty Slack channels, and it's possible to draw the inference that data may have been deleted prior to export, but before producing to Red Wolf, that goes a lot further in terms of helping the judge understand the implication of what that means. In addition, it, it also caused the opposing counsel's expert to have to refute that inference. So if we really didn't help the judge make informed logical inferences, there would not, not be anything for opposing counsel to have to re refute. And what they did is contact Slack directly. And Slack confirmed that one possibility for these empty channels was that it could mean data was purposely deleted prior to export. So it opened a whole can of worms and it actually, you know, hurt, hurt their testimony on the other side, which became a focal point for the judge, you know, and I think this compare and contrasting of different points of view uh, where there was actual agreement from both sides about the possible causation for the empty Slack channels was was really compelling. And I, I think, you know, it was something the judge not only latched on to, but featured quite a bit in his opinion. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to jump in there and, and echo that, Colleen, because I wanted to tell you, um, we talk in this in this webinar about the smoking gun email, but really there were two smoking guns. And this second one is is it these empty Slack channels. Um, and that that is 100 percent from United Lex. We did not understand the import of that. And, and what came back from Slack was, well, it's either someone deleted it or someone started a message and never finished it. And it's it's pretty weird that that would happen 87 times, um, in my opinion. But I do think that that really was the second smoking gun. And the judge said, hey, you know, if, if we have to come back to this, we're going to get into that. And, you know, but I do, I think, I think that doesn't get enough recognition. And that was you and Derek, uh, if I recall right, who actually raised that to our attention. Um, Derek, you have something to add to this? Yeah, no, yeah, that was, that was something that our, our team was able to extract and, and one, and I thank you, John. Um, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, I, I think it's really important to go deep, you know, on the technical side, you know, go all the way to the source data, the extracted JSON data. But it's also important to kind of take a, um, a high level view of what a producing party could have easily done to check their own work, right? Which I think we illustrated really well in the affidavit in this matter. Um, you know, like Doug showed us all uh, in the beginning of this presentation, Slack stands for searchable log of all communication and knowledge. So I, I find it very funny uh, that the opposing expert said that Slack has limited search capabilities or unreliable search <laughs> capabilities, but that's, that's a different issue. You know, I, it's, it's, uh, that if you want to make sure that your productions are complete and you're, you're properly responding to requests for documents, you know, you, you, you have your data in a system that is a searchable log, right? And so you can perform those searches yourself, uh, as part of a QC process. Just because you can't search and export from Slack by default doesn't mean you can't go in there and check your own work. And I think that's a really important practice point for parties who may be of a limited resources and who just think, you know, oh, I can't, you know, afford a high end vendor to do all this, you know, expensive work, which, by the way, it's not that expensive anymore. But even so, there are very practical steps that you can take inside your own platform to, to check your work. Uh, you know, and, and like, and they're very simple solutions that can supplement your, your broader approach. Like, like Doug was saying, it's very difficult to reconstruct an emoji, which is true. But if you're concerned about a particular conversation in a case and you want to produce that, it's okay to screenshot that as a supplement to your underlying production, right? Your underlying forensically sound collection. You could say, okay, this is what it looks like. Let me make it easy for you to see what this looks like. So there are some 
what I would call low tech or highly accessible solutions that people can employ as part of their process that they need to be thinking about. And they can't always be focused on, on the fancy tools or what I like to call the magic fairy dust AI, which, you know, puts all the slack and the messages together and then wins your case for you, which I don't think actually exists. All great points. So uh, we um, obviously we could have spent the entire hour talking about the case. Uh, I skipped ahead to the recommendation slide, which we will just leave up here. We recognize we're four minutes, almost five minutes uh, beyond the uh, top of the hour. And we're going to stay on for about uh, another six or seven minutes and try to address as many of your questions as we can. And if you any of you have to drop off, know that you will get access to the recording as well as the slides. So you'll be able to check it later. So a couple of questions that I think are kind of related. Um, uh, and I'll address these to Derek. Uh, first one is, can you recommend examples of specific interrogatories and RFPs that are well-designed to elicit data from collaboration tools? And the second one is, with respect to production and file formats, any thoughts on native format versus different formats and any considerations that may be overlooked? You've kind of addressed that a tad just uh, with your last response, but uh, anything you want to add to that discussion? All right, I'm, I'm going to try the, the feat of d doing the twofer, answering two <laughs> questions. With one, there we one go, answer. I'm throwing it out to you then. <laughs> All right, so I, I trapped Doug into giving me a, a shameless plug. So um, I, I drafted an article called No Stone Unturned, Targeting Unknown or Unique Data Sources During Discovery. I was a co-author of that paper. It's on ABA Law Magazine. It's behind a paywall, um, but if anyone wants it, um, feel free to shoot me an email uh, and I'll get them a copy of it. But basically, you need to use the intelligent um, use of, of interrogatories, talking about you know, how they use their systems and how they get their work done, right? The rise of collaborative applications and them containing all of this relevant data is really just a, you know, an adjustment of how we all perform our work. So talk about you know, how do your salespeople track their deals? How do they upload new leads and then ask for you know what platform is that data stored on what is the retention policy on that data what type of metadata is stored around that system right and then talk about how that data is maintained and exported and then you could request documents after you've requested that underlying context with with really pointed interrogatories so um, and then on, on the flip side, you really want to coordinate with an expert in e-discovery that could be internal to your firm or external, depending on your capabilities. Um, but, you know, always be thinking about um, making sure they can check the responses to these interrogatories so that they are clear enough that you can map their responses to existing systems in their environment, right? You want to make sure that their answer about, you know, oh, our leads are tracked in Salesforce, right? Or HubSpot versus, you know, tracked in a CRM or in spreadsheets. Like you want to make sure that there is some specificity around where that data lives. Um, and then you also want to make sure that the production format is done in a way that allows you to verify their answers to your interrogatories. So if, if, you, if they say that certain metadata is, is held within the system, you want to make sure that the production format, which is usually native, but can sometimes be an export of a database, make sure that production format is going to contain that metadata that you asked about in those interrogatories so that you can perform your own audit. Because I think that's one of the big lessons of Red Wolf right here is, right? It's not about asking the great questions and you know just having the great consultant but a lot of it is about doing that diligent tracking of i've asked for this information this was your answer right what have you given to me what type of information do you hold and that that legal diligence to get the court to make the other side produce enough information so you can really analyze the uh, completeness of their productions absolutely great point um, at great points, I should say. Um, so uh, uh, here's a question. Uh, uh, cultural nuances, non-traditional data, to what degree has cultural nuances, internationally speaking, in their interpretation pose challenges? Any thoughts on implications? Uh, do any of you all have a thought about that? 
I would certainly say that one of the things that I would probably expect is um, if you do have cultural considerations that you probably need to have um, uh, to engage team members who have some expertise in that area. And that's certainly one of the things that I think is uh, something you see, especially in international cases, is you do see some of those challenges. So that's certainly my thought. Um, anybody have anything to add or should I move on? No, I, I, I think that's an important um, point, Doug. I, I would say, especially with, with applications uh, related to China, just know that there are a lot of different versions of the applications there versus here. So I would not, I think it's really important to have that cultural and geographic sensitivity around, you know, where your data sources are coming from and do not assume that you're, analysis or insights that can be performed on a US-based form of an app is directly transferable to something that is, is Chinese-based or something with a Chinese user. So you definitely need to have someone who has that expertise in both. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll address this one really quick because I can channel my, in, my inner uh, Judge Peck on this one. Uh, <laughs> with regard to privileged material that has been inadvertently produced, is constructing a clawback agreement with the spirit of FRCP 502D sufficient to address such? Uh, and absolutely, uh, as Judge Peck would say, uh, you should always have a 502D and he considers it malpractice not to. Um, so absolutely, that's one of the things things that you uh, want to keep in mind is have that 502D order, and um, that's going to protect you in a lot of situations, not just in the case you're in, but in other cases as well. So uh, I will, I'll address that one. Another question we got was given the increasing prevalence of IOTs and BYOD practices, and I guess we can lump collaboration apps, what's uh, more challenging for organizations in determining methodology to include data mapping? Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that one? Seems to me like they, they're they all uh, challenging because they're all uh, pretty new and, and different for organizations. Yeah. But I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I, I have some thoughts on this, you know, as, as someone who's, who's done a few data maps in, in his day. Um, you know, data mapping in, in the era of remote work is, is really difficult. And what I would say is rely very heavily on the work that is being done by your privacy, security, and IT infrastructure teams um, because they need to secure all that data and they're probably gonna have a data map that is light years ahead of anything that you could pull together. So try and build on top of or coordinate with their initiatives um, rather than trying to do one on your own. Um, and then the other side is, you know, be ready to data map on the fly uh, in, the, in the IoT and BYOD world. You know, just like I said, certain certain MacBooks will give you access to signal while others won't. So you really are going to need to have a disciplined approach to what data is available to you in this particular case and pulling from those various data sources, building out a timeline. And a lot of that work is, you know, manual and strategic on the front end of the case, but it's work that has to be done. It'll save you a lot of work downstream. Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Derek. Um, another uh, quick uh, question. Many companies only retain chat data for a limited number of days. For example, my employer only retains chat data for seven days. Have you seen examples of parties expediting the discovery of chat data due to the narrower retention periods? Uh, certainly, I'll mention that one of the cases, when you get the slides, one of the cases is, uh, involves a party that changed their retention period to seven days after um, uh, after um, uh, anticipation of litigation. So they got sanctioned for that. Um, but absolutely, one of the things I think you see with a lot of chat and collaboration apps is with short, potentially short retention periods or even ephemeral messaging, which we really haven't touched on, uh, the getting the... Uh, the, getting the notice of, of preservation, the preservation notice out to the party is certainly something that's got to be expedited at the very least. Would you all agree? Yeah, Doug, that's, I was going to jump in with that and say one of the things we do in cases for our own clients is get that out. But one of the things I do also is, you know, put the other side on notice. I expect them to be doing it from, from day one. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so uh, we are at time and uh, we are going to have to let it uh, turn it back over to Mary, but we will reach out to folks and try to see if we can address questions after the fact as well. So Mary, I will turn it on uh, back over to you to wrap us up. All right. Thanks, Doug. Uh, make sure you take a look at the little paper clip for more resources about this case. And we are so grateful uh, to Doug Austin, Derek Duarte, Colleen Freeman, and John Sten for this very trend forward presentation. And our thanks to the eDiscovery Today and EDRM communities for your kind attention. We'll see you next time on the EDRM Global Webinar Channel. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.